How are you doing today, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. It's a bit uh, it's been a long day for me, if I could say so myself. Um, the time difference is quite uh, yeah significant. So it I is. It is. Staying up late. Yeah. To accommodate me early in the morning. Yeah. Um, I think the first question I want to dive in, which is probably like the most juiciest, would be, uh, Wolfpack season two. Now, I know that you aren't, like, on the writing team or, like, working to promote, like, Wolfpack Season 2, but, like, w would you want to see Wolfpack Season 2? And if it is a yes, what would you want to, like, see in Season 2? Um, I just want to see the continuation of Jeff Davis's vision. Um, I'd love to see more elements that uh, come from my books. Yeah. To be in the... Uh, in the show and i know that there's probably the uh, original scene where uh, ranger uh, briggs discovers the wolf cubs in the after the fire i mean that's that scene opens the, the book series and at some point in series in season two there's going to be a discussion of how he discovered them yeah because kirsten ramsey's going to divulge her side of it he's going to divulge his side of it i'm sure and hopefully they can use more of that uh, video i know they've they probably uh, filmed the scene because they were using snippets of it as flashbacks in season one so it's probably all there and that's what i hope for but i just hope that uh, <clears throat> if there's a season two it continues on uh, with jeff davis's vision and uh, is a success speaking about that scene where uh Briggs has that uh that flashback of the Cubs. Uh, I don't know if you caught it or not, but when they're in their wolf form in universe in the show, at least their eyes are actually purple instead of yellow. Well, was that an aspect that was ever in your like book series? I it's all along that um, my books are the guy, uh, not the guidebook. They're the inspiration for, not the guidebook. So um, the only mention of uh, eye color in the books is uh argus who yeah. is the strongest of the the four and the one that resolves to uh, physical re resolutions rather than uh, strategic ones or you know uh, thoughtful or clever ones he has one eye a different color than the other yeah which sometimes happens in wolves and and uh, huskies and things like that so whatever color they want to make it an eye color, I know that's big for the fans, but for me personally, whichever eye color looks best on camera, that's uh, it's good for me. Yeah, I, I was never expecting it to be purple, though. It's pretty surprising because usually in, like, werewolf media, they're normally yellow or red. So purple is an interesting color. Um, now that Wolfpack Season 1 has concluded, what is your initial thoughts on the finale of the season? Um, well, I've said this before in uh, one of my uh, Wolfpack Facts videos, which are on YouTube. Um, throughout the first season, all of the threats to the pack were supernatural. And suddenly, at the end, in five minutes, every single threat to the pack is now human. Yeah. You have police coming in, Child Protective Services, um, mental health professionals coming in and suddenly it's not supernatural threat it's all human threat and we've got a whole new uh, thing to figure out so that's the, the main difference and in the books the threats are all human school bullies government uh, angry townspeople guns that kind of thing it's uh, never a supernatural threat so i was happy to see that but um, that's the biggest change it was like a, a shift that went almost instantaneously. And yeah. I didn't see it coming, and hopefully no one else did. Well, with the finale, it's actually um, caused a bit of a triumph within the community because I know that there was um, episodes that were actually cut from production. There was supposed to be a 10-episode series, so they had to refilm a lot of things. Were you pleased with the finale of Wolfpack? I'm not going to get caught in whether I was pleased or, or make a you know something that displeased me. Yeah. I was pleased with it all. As I said before, it was a great way to end it, a big switch, and... Um, a cliffhanger. And we've seen the big mad monsters all the way through, and suddenly, well, they're gone, and now it's, uh, 
you know, the human monster that is the problem. So I thought that was great. Yeah, it, it, they left it on like a, a big cliffhanger and room for more seasons to grow. Like we have uh, the caller who we don't know who it is in universe yet. We have Baron and Christine who like are now a team. And then we have uh, the, uh, I can't remember his name now, Malcolm, who was also there. So it, it, it leaves room for a big cliffhanger. And hopefully moving towards season two, we could see a lot of those storylines ended. Well, Jeff Davis knows what he's doing. And I'm sure that when they met in the writer's room, they uh, discussed uh, uh, story arcs that stretched well past season one. And um, yeah, the uh, first season was supposed to be a two, a 10 episodes. It got cut to eight. And uh, I don't know. I, I never saw any of the screenplays. I don't know uh, what the story arc was supposed to be. But uh, yeah, there, there's plenty of room for uh, expansion and uh you know, Jeff Davis knows what he's doing. Yeah. 100 episodes or with uh, Teen Wolf. If we could do that with uh, Wolfpack, that would be great. But he knows what he's doing, and I'm sure he's got... Uh... When I did see him on set, he said... Um, I said, well, hopefully it goes a couple seasons. And he said, right out of the blue, oh, eight. And I don't know if he's got storylines for eight or what, but that was the number he threw out there. So I'm sure he's got a plan moving forward um yeah the thing is with that though is he was recently in an article and he said that um wolf pack season one he wasn't serious about until there isn't like new subscribers to paramount plus and people are actually watching wolf pack so if he has plans for eight season that is really like really really reassuring because people think that jeff davis doesn't care really, like doesn't currently care about wolf pack at the moment which is uh unfortunate but if he says there's eight seasons that he wants then that's reassuring well, to think in any way, shape, or form that Jeff Davis doesn't care about or has little interest in it. I mean, this is his livelihood. This is what he does. He's yeah. a television writer, a showrunner. This is his show right now. <clears throat> and, of course, he's going to do everything to make it a success. Um, people on the outside looking in, and even myself, I don't know how things work in Hollywood. I don't know how things work in the boardrooms, how decisions are made, you know, and uh, sure, it could be easy to s stay on the outside and say, oh, he doesn't care about it, but he cares with every bit of his being yeah. because that's his baby right now. That's what he has going, and he wants to be a success, of course. Everybody does, and um, whatever happened in the first season and comes off like he doesn't care. I just want to rest assured, lay everything to rest that no, he cares deeply about the series and it is his prime motivator right now moving forward. Yeah. Um, I hope I can speak for Jeff on that. Yeah. Speaking from someone who's had contact with him uh, sporadically, but uh, I can tell you that he and everyone else involved in the show is very committed to producing the best they can. For yeah. Them. Now, I know that you were on set because you shared some images with me. Uh, are you able to re like reveal what episodes you were on set for? Uh, it was um, episode seven. Episode seven. Um, and the last day we were um, filming, that was the scene where... Uh, our Monty Jackson was in the bathroom looking into the mirror. Yeah. And Baron appeared. And they were filming that part. That was the last thing before we, we left to, to come home. So throughout that, uh, the first scene was uh, when um, Everett was uh, speaking with his mother. And there was the... Uh, the transfer of keys there where they had that moment yeah uh, he was defiant to her like for the first time took the keys and she was like stunned at what just happened that was the very first scene that we saw the last scene was him in the, the bathroom with baron coming out. um what was your favorite moment behind set can you say that again what was your favorite moment like being behind set um well i'll tell you when we got there they had been filming for uh, three months, so somebody uh, new appearing on the on the set was like, "Who are who is these people? Who are these people?" 
and we spend you know a couple of hours people like looking at us kind of strangely is this someone from the network is this someone from the union someone like and uh finally uh, it was the uh, second day maybe a woman uh, named Barbara, she's a costume designer. She came up and said, oh, new people. And she introduced herself. And uh, my wife said, uh, oh, we would love to meet some uh, some of the cast members. And she said, just wait right here. And she went off and brought um, Bella Shepard over. And then we met uh, uh, Rainer and uh, Tyler. And uh, eventually you met just about everybody. But uh, that was the most fun part. But, and just being part of the set and the production and being on set and you know just witness to it and to know that everything going on has to do with something that you wrote and you created and uh, that was uh, exciting you know like and as a matter of fact the first person who, who uh, recognized me his name was ben and he was a member of the crew and his uh, job was to look after walkie talkies so i'm sure it was more involved than that but that's how he explained it to me and he said, you're Edo, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he had a copy of my book in his backpack. So I was like, oh, this is so great. You know, people recognize me. People have copies of my book. And uh, it was fun. It was just once in a lifetime experience. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just, it was surreal, really. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but Sarah Michelle Gellar did confirm that Wolfpack Season 2 is currently being talked about, you know, in studios, and they are discussing the next, like, installment of the series. If it does happen, I know you mentioned, but, like, previously that you want to see more from the books made into, like, live action. What would, what would it, like, be, oh, sorry, let me rephrase. What do you want to see from your books brought to live action that hasn't been seen as of yet? Well, as I said, the, the opening scene, uh, the opening scene of the the novels is Ranger in the book Ranger Brock fighting the fire and as he's fighting the fire a wolf comes out of the flames carrying a wolf cub in its maw and then depositing it in a place that's safe yeah and going back into the fire a sec a first time second time a third time coming out and putting four because in the book there's four not two and then him kind of trying to stop the wolf from going back again and it goes into the flames one last time and never seen again it's a it's a tense dramatic scene it's a great opening for the book it's the scene that i pitched to the editor of the book line and she said yeah write up a proposal and send it to me so i did that over the phone and it's just an exciting scene and it has a, a twist at the end we've already been the seen the twist at the end uh, during the season where he brings the cubs home and, and is on the phone talking about bringing him to a shelter and then you see the the hand come out mine is a little different from that but that's the scene that i'd like to see there's some scenes uh, that happen at school yeah with uh, bullies and things like that interaction with other students it would be great to see something like that um you know just a little I'd be happy with just the little things, but I'm saying I'd be happy with it. That's not to say I'd be unhappy if those things don't happen. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm happy that, you know, if there's season two, it's on the screen. Great. And uh, let's see what Jeff has in store. What is, um, apart from like the, uh, the cub scene in Wolfpack season one, that flashback scene where they got, is there any other moments that have been your favorite as of yet within the show? Um, there was a couple. Um, one was the scene where the werewolf is uh, climbing the scaffolding. Yeah. With a body in its uh, one hand and climbing with the other. I just love the, the sequence of her first hearing the sound and then getting a slow reveal of the, the legs moving up and then a, a better reveal and then finally realizing, oh, he's carrying a body up there. That was just like really great and um i couldn't have put in something like that in my books but um because nobody really gets killed in the books because yeah for a, a younger audience let's be straightforward with that but i thought that was terrific just a bit of cinematic reveal slow reveal you know 
playing with your expectations. What the hell is this noise? What's going on? And then seeing that, I thought that was great. And the other one that uh, really, no, okay, there's two more I'll, I'll get to. Uh, it's episode five, where Kristen Ramsey there, and the security guard discover the bodies mm. in the pit. And he's looking down and he's like, what's going on? And suddenly, wham, she gets him with a flashlight. And I thought, holy cow, I didn't see that coming. It was like a, a perfect setup. You know, you didn't expect it to happen. You, sh you thought she was the antagonist to the, the pack, but somehow she's more deeply involved and somehow a protector or something. She's who knows what. But this was like a, a total uh, 180. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic. It was unfortunate we had to go wait till the episode five because some people might not have got that far. But um, I thought that one was. Uh, quite uh, jarring and I like that a lot and then the third one is when um, Ranger uh, Briggs uh, reveals to the uh, pack that he has silver bullets and he had them made just in case they went offside and uh, and I thought wow that's really good and I wish I'd had that in my books yeah that would have been something I'd be proud of to include it little bit of forethought but of course i'm one man writing four books about this and i have a limited imagination but when you get a writer's room and you get you know five and you have you give them a, a problem to solve or something to let their imagination run wild of course they're thinking of really great things and i like the way they revealed the hand there coming out the baby's hand mine was a little bit more in your face of course yeah but I like that a lot. And, um, yeah, I just thought there were some elements there that I was jealous of because I didn't think of them. <laughs> yeah. I did it. So, uh, well done. Um, you said that uh, the books are intended for a younger audience. Was it surprising seeing how graphic the TV show was? Um, yes. Before the show even aired, I saw interviews with Jeff Davis saying that it was going to be uh, darker and more, um, did he say sexual or, I don't think he used that word, but it was darker and more violent than uh, Teen Wolf. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, then that's not, you know, straight from the books because the books were um, written for middle, uh, middle grade students and it was, you know, properly written for them because it won a couple of awards one especially voted on by the grades four five and six so you know i did my part so he uh, took that and expanded on it and made it his own and created it for television so um i was i was surprised when i heard that and i thought wow let's see what's going to happen i look forward to seeing this and um i was kind of um uh, Please, in the opening scene there with the fire in the school bus, and um, especially when that one uh, deer slams up against uh, somebody on the road and against the car, and I thought, yeah. okay, we're, we're going all in on this. You yeah, know, It's not going to be cut away and have someone screaming off camera and then looking at it later. We're going to get to see all of, the, all of the rough stuff. So I was quite pleased by that. You know, if you're going to go in that direction you might as well go all the way because there's you know no pleasing everybody if you're only stuck halfway so yeah um, i was you know happy that he'd made decisions like that and decided to go for them and go all the way all in would um would you ever imagine your book series like if you're like rewriting it again would you write it any differently now that you've seen the show it's an interesting question um Probably, uh, well, who, there's no writer alive that would be writing a series of books like this thinking, oh, when it is a TV show, you know, because it yeah. took 16 years for anyone to show interest uh, in the books for TV. So I don't think I would have written it any differently. Um, the way I wrote the books is I wanted to write 
adventure books for a younger audience and respect the audience not be silly or talk down to them be respectful and you know this is the way things happen in the real world for example i didn't make the government uh, entity the villain when the mad scientist wants to take one of the wolf cubs out of the forest in the wolf form he's captured him this is a long story but the person that comes from the government is trying to protect the pack yeah. because of their part of, in nature. You know, not like the easy villain. Oh, he's from the government. He's the bad guy. No, that person is a good person trying to do his job, doing the right thing. So I wrote it with respect to the, the young readers who would be reading it, not talking down to them. And I think that that made a difference. Yeah. And I don't think I would have written it any other way. I wrote it the way it ha it should have been written and the winning the silver birch award i think is evidence that yes my instincts were correct and it was done properly and then having it being picked up for a tv series is icing on the cake that is something that is one in a million struck by lightning winning the lottery in the same day kind of thing and <clears throat> just testimony that whatever i did in writing the books was the right thing yeah if you had to pick between one either a tv show or a movie it just seemed like wolfpack to be like adapted into either one of them which one would you pick <laughs> wow well, let's just uh, this is like buying a lottery ticket for a 10 million dollar prize and then just discussing whether we should buy an airplane or a boat first yeah um you know either one is so far out of the realm of what is possible or what you would expect to happen um there's two ways to look at it if it was a film which it could have been because i don't know if the people at paramount always thought of tv series or maybe it could be adapted for a, a movie in terms of being a, a movie the first book would be a, the storyline for the for a movie and if they made a movie of that and followed the book the way it is like um linearly linearly and you know here's the beginning here's the middle this is the scene out of the book that would have been fantastic but if it was a movie it would be over it would be over right uh if it's a tv series it went on for th three months and i had the pleasure of every you know thursday yeah they're done for the and uh, sitting down and, and watching the next episode, which, which was terrific. So, um, you know, do you like uh, bacon with your eggs or eggs with your bacon? Yeah. Uh, either one would have been great, but I'm just ecstatic the way it happened. And, you know, there's a possibility that it can continue. I, I have to say, the 18 months leading up to the show and when the show was on were the most fun I've ever had as a writer. And now I get the opportunity, perhaps, to see it continue for another 18 months if there's a season two or even past that, season three and four. Wow. Who could ask for more? So yeah, I'm happy that it's a TV series. And uh, I would have been just as ecstatic if it was a, a film. But I'm happy the way it is and where it's going. Sure. I mean, there always is a possibility. I'm pretty sure no one thought, you know, 12 years ago when Teen Wolf came out that it would ever become a movie. So... Hopefully in the future we could ever like we could see Wolfpack adapted into a movie version. Sure, um, you know they own the property now, so uh, Paramount could uh, run it for a few seasons, come out with a TV movie. They could do a, an animated series. You know, yeah, they, could, they would give them all kinds of possibilities to explore different things, and you know it wouldn't be set by budgetary constraints or things like that. And who knows what. It's their property now, and um, if they have plans for it past this, let's just one thing at a time. Season two, yeah. maybe, first, and then uh, after it's canceled and there's some time in between, um, we'll see. But uh, sure, they own the property, and who knows what they have plans for, it. and whatever they decide. Now, I... I can't deny them. I don't have a no trade clause. Like no, no, no move, no feature film. I, I don't have per, first right of refusal. So 
whatever they decide, I'll be good with that. Wait, uh, could you like uh, say again who owns the property of Wolfpack now? CBS Viacom, which okay. owns Paramount. And, yeah. So if CBS Viacom was to come to you and basically give you the rights to make other books of Wolfpack, would you ever take like take the mantle up again, or do you think that Wolfpack in the book version is now complete and that you've written everything you could? Well, it's, that's an interesting question because uh, the contract I have allows me to write more books in the series. Um, the problem with that is I don't know how much um, appetite there is for more books in the series. We've done the first book in uh, print form. I have a copy right here. Yay. So that's in print form. It's also available in electronic form and audio. But that's the only one that's available in print. Yeah. The other three in the series aren't available in print. They could be in the future. But we weren't able to sell them as a package to a publisher to do new editions of all four. So what's the point of pitching a fifth book when you know I could, and we could probably do it in ebook version and that, and but it, unless there are, people are screaming like they're screaming for season two of Wolfpack, they're saying we want a fifth book in the series, then I do it, of course. But there isn't that kind of demand, so we're we're working with what we have, the four books that exist, one in print form, all four available in ebook, and all four available in uh, audio, and. Uh, who knows? I'm never going to say no to anything for in perpetuity, but as it stands right now, I have no plans for writing a fifth book. Yeah. Before I move on to the next question, where is it that people can actually find these books online or in store? In stores is tricky. I don't... I don't well, I mean, I mean like, so mostly, like, where, where can they go to find these books online then? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, if you just type in my name and Wolfpack, you're going to get Amazon... If you go to my, um, if you go to the Jabberwocky Literary Agency uh, website and uh, look under authors and find my name, each book you have a, you can, there's a roll down list of like five different online vendors that you can purchase it from. <clears throat> you can also buy the used books off uh, <clears throat> eBay, but I don't recommend that because for some reason books two, three, and four are just crazy stupid price, like $70 for number two. And the fourth book, is, well, it's rare to be sure, but they're charging a two, three, $400 for it or asking that much. I don't know if anyone bought them. Yeah. That price. <clears throat> but the eBooks are available, you know, anywhere. And the audio books are available at Amazon and Audible. Um, so... If you can't find it, you're not looking hard enough because a, a Google search with my name and the book title will bring you to some place that sells it. Yeah. Now, I know that you went through a few cover arts for the Wolfpack book series. What has been your favorite as of yet? Because I know there's a new one that has been uh, publicly shown around. It's one you had in your hand just then. Is that your favorite one as of yet? Well, um, I think the one you're mentioning is the uh, Ara uh, Arabic version. It has uh, wolves on it and a fire in the background, yeah. and it looks really cool. And yeah, that one is uh, <clears throat> very cool, and I like that a lot. It's funny that the first uh, iteration of the cover had um, five werewolves on it. Four wolves and the one werewolf. But there's only four in the first book, so I asked them to remove one, and they did. In the, on uh, one side where there's more fire. So now there's four on the cover and lots of fire. So that one is pretty cool. Uh, one that's also i quite fond of is this one here. Lupi Selvaggi. It's from the first uh, the Italian edition. And uh, it's got a very, pretty cool looking werewolf on there. <clears throat> Ironically, there's going to be another Italian edition sometime in the future from a different publisher. So... We're going to see another thing there, plus a Czech edition from the Czech Republic. But um, to finish off, the first uh, cover of the book, terrible. Yeah. And I blame myself for that because the artist had a certain view and certain way that the wolves were going to look. And uh, 
I kept telling him to make it more like dog, more dog like. You can see it behind me here. Yeah. That's the cover there. Um, and it ended up looking like a dog. And I was like, oh, I can't ask him to change it again to back to the way he had it. He's going to be furious. So we left it that way. Thank God it won the awards and was a bestseller, <laughs> uh, not because of the cover. And that's all my fault. So the rest of the books, I decided I'm just going to leave them the way they are because he's got a vision. I'm the writer. He's the artist. I'll let him do the drawing and painting and I'll just write the books. And uh, that was fine. The new edition was kind of, it was done by a, a graphic artist and I had, and the agency had input on it. And we came up with, you know, this one, which is very, uh, respectful, very cute 2023. And, uh, I think it looks pretty cool. And the other ones followed suit. So I'm, I'm very happy with the way they look and hopefully you know, a lot of people will see it when, uh, if there's uh, hard copies of the other three books, that'd be great. I think it came out really well. What has been your favorite book to write as of yet? Okay. <clears throat> there's one book, like I get this question uh, quite a bit, like which of your books is your favorite? And it's usually in some setting where you're with younger people. And I tell them, uh, well, when your parents come to you and when do you ask them like, which is your favorite child like who's your favorite they don't have an answer because they love all their children the same but i do have one that is very close to my heart and that's uh, death drives the semi mm. and of course you're asking me that and i don't have a copy handy but anyway it's a collection of short stories there's uh 19 stories there's 20 now we added one and i'll get to that in a minute and it is the kind of book that I got into writing that I wanted to produce. My favorite book of all time is The October Country by Ray Bradbury. 20, uh, 19 or 20 short stories in there. Every one I enjoyed thoroughly. And when I finished reading, I said, that's the kind of book I want to write. I want to write a book just like this, with all these stories in it. And people can say, that was a great story. I love that. And it's 25 years since that book was published. And we're doing a, in October, we're doing a 25th anniversary uh, reprint. And just today, I got a cover uh, quote from Jeff Davis that's going on the back cover, saying how much he enjoyed it and all the reasons why. So uh, thanks to Jeff for that. And um, it's just a, a terrific uh, book. I'm so proud of it. It's got the Bram Stoker winning story, a rat food. It's got my first uh, publication, Baseball Memories, which was reprinted in Year's Best Horror Stories. It's got The Rug in it, which was a Bram Stoker Award finalist. And all these other stories uh, that really give you a sense of who I am, what I am as a writer. Wolfpack was written for young adults. Death Drives the Semi, which is the name of the book, uh, for adults. And No Holds Barred, you know, everything... Uh, is a fair game, lots of violence, lots of sex, lots of, you know, profanity, everything in there is for adults and it's uh, full bore. My favorite book of all time. Yeah. Uh, circling back to the question I had a little while ago about if you ever to write a new book, um, would you ever, if you do write a, like a new book in the future, would you then take aspects that were brought onto the show and apply it to the fifth book? Or do you think that because the, the father books are then you know, designed for people of a younger age that you would keep it in that category? Uh, that's an interesting question too. And I've thought about that. Um, I don't think it's possible hmm. because the, although the basic premise is the same in both the TV series and the books, it's a family drama, the Wolfpack books. And it's a supernatural mystery on TV. So, and there's name changes and things like that. And I did think about if someone approached me to write books <clears throat> based on the television series, I'd have to think about that because that'd be a whole new thing. And I don't know what you would call it. You'd call it Wolfpack. There's already Wolfpack books. Would it be Jeff Davis's Wolfpack? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, it's... I don't think I would add elements to the series. I mean, once you start to do things like that, that's when you're in trouble. Yeah. When you're writing a, an artistic and intellectual property 
based on your personal vision and you have a, a absolute clarity of where it goes and what it should be, then it can be successful. If I wanted, if I tried to do that and then say, oh, I'm going to add this and that, it's going to cloud the issue. It's going to make things, people are going to question where did that come from? How did that come in? Because there's been four books to set all the rules of how things work in this universe. Suddenly I'm adding something from a different universe and that would probably cause confusion and we may want that with readers. And um, yeah, so it, I like the question and I have thought about it myself. Uh, but no, if I wrote an, a fifth book, it would be a continuation of the four of the scenarios and storylines that I set up in yeah. the books, not the storylines of the TV series. Now, I know that I've asked you about your favorite moment in the TV show. Do you have a favorite character in the TV show and also in the book series? Um, I think favorite character in both would be the ranger. Yeah. He is in both books. Um, his, he's very similar in the TV series and the books. And... Um, I, I just wish they, they'd called him Ranger Brock, but mm. Jeff told me that they had discussions about that, and uh, Paramount decided to change the name. I think because of uh, Spawn's name, his last name is Brock. Yeah. Is that right? Um, I know Eddie Brock, who Eddie plays Brock. Venom, who looks like Spawn, but yeah, you talked about this yeah. in the last interview that so, we did. Let's just say that there's other characters that have that surname, uh, major characters, and they didn't want confusion. Yeah. So uh, I do like the Ranger, and I do like Rodrigo Santoro's portrayal of him. I met him on uh, set, and he seemed very committed, very in tune to what, what and who the Ranger could be. And he could play the Ranger if they made a straight uh, adaptation of the book story and or the TV series that they did. He would fit well in both, so I'm quite pleased with that. And he's he's taking it seriously he plays it very straightforward and i like that he's well prepared and um, he's also the guiding figure in the book series the pack looks up to him in the book series they never call him dad in the book series by the way they call him the ranger or ranger brock yeah as a as a title of respect because the pack realizes he is like a guardian of the forest which is important to them so they never really call him dad, but they treat him as a father and respect him as a father. Yeah. Um, here's one other thing about characters. I did um, meet uh, uh, Nob, Nobby. I can't remember his last name. The gentleman who plays the uh, principal on the show. Mm. Um, I apologize to him. I remember his first <laughs> name now, and that is Nakanishi, I think his last name is. Like oh, that. I think I know he's known... I know his name too. Um, I know who you're talking about. I do know who you're talking yeah. about. So I met him at the premiere and uh, he said, oh, I play the, uh, the the principal in the show. And I said, oh my God, please tell me that your name, your last name is Terashita because he's a Japanese gentleman in the books. The principal is named Terashita. He said, uh, no. And they changed that name too. And I was mm. like, oh my God, are you kidding me? You couldn't keep that. A ja it was a Japanese name. They couldn't even keep it. But that's that's fine. I'm glad that whether Jeff cast it as a Japanese uh, actor, an Asian actor, because it was in the book that way, I'm pleased with that. And I'm just like, oh, couldn't get that name right either. But I'm, I'm happy that he's in there and he does a good job. And I was uh, pleased to meet him, so quite pleased. And uh, so, yeah, the characters, my favorite character is clearly uh, the Ranger, the Ranger. Yeah. Now, I have a question that is about the books and, of course, the TV series. Now, in the TV show, as we know that when the pack members are separated, they can't access their full abilities and they have one. Like, Harlan has hearing, Everett has strength, I think Luna has smell, and then I think Blake has speed. And when they're all together, they can access it, like, all together. Was that ever thing brought into the books as well? Or that was actually written originally in the books? Um, that's a good question, too. In the book, each member of the pack has a, a skill or ability that is better 
than another member. Yeah. So clearly Jeff took that and gave them specific things that are even greater when they're together. When they're in a group, they realize that some have abilities that others don't, and those members take over the lead for that. You know, like we're running through the forest tracking somebody, and um, like as a team, they work like a team. Has the best uh, sense of smell, but that one would be, uh, and uh, they haven't mentioned it yet, but in the book series, Harlan has an ability with uh, computers. The hmm. technology um, they haven't broached that yet maybe they, they will at some point and uh, just a little note that people will find uh, Harlan in the book series is the runt of the litter the smallest and I named him Harlan in deference to Harlan Ellison the science fiction writer who was a man with a, a lion's heart and huge character and you know voracious character could take over a room but he was a small man and i just thought i'm gonna name him harlan and it's kind of ironic that in the tv series harlan prior to lawrence gray seems to be the largest i know yeah. he's only slightly larger but physically in the presence on screen he looks far larger than armani jackson does and but he's still named harlan and i got a kick out of that the the runt of the litter in the books is actually the biggest in the tv series but i'm all good with that now I know we talked this uh, talked about this in the last time we like we on a recording together, but was there ever like you know in Teen Wolf there is Alpha, Beta, or Omega? Was that ever in your book series? No. Okay. Um, uh, I never went for anything like that. Um, my idea when I started was there were going to be teenagers with all teenage problems, plus the werewolves. Yeah. So they go to they have to go to school. There's going to be bullies. The ranger has forbidden them to use any of their abilities in school against humans because he's afraid that one of them is going to kill somebody. For example, uh, Argus, the strongest. Uh, the football coach is always asking him, when are you going to come out for the team? Come on out for the team. And he says, no, 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 I can't. I don't, I don't want to. Because the ranger has forbidden him. I know in, in Teen Wolf, there's the lacrosse going on. And, and he does, at times, they use their powers and they excel on the field. But that was forbidden by the ranger in the Teen Wolf series. And um, so it was only about teenagers with teenage problems. Plus, they've got this ad burden that they're werewolves. They have to keep that secret. Yeah. And they have to live their lives and sort of away from that. So that was the whole thing. There was no alpha, beta, no hierarchy of who they were. And as a matter of fact, in the first book, there is no other way. In the second book, they come across a werewolf named uh, Phelan, who knows what happened to their mother and father, and he tells them what's what happened in the story there. But no, there was never any of that when I wrote the book. Well, if you had to pick one in the TV series to be the leader of the pack, who would you pick? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't seen enough of the characters like in the in the first season they all seem to participate equally yeah uh i don't i didn't see one that stepped forward and came out with some brilliant idea or the plan the plan and here's what we should do <clears throat> and these things happen organically right in the t in the book series noble became the default leader because he always seemed to have the best ideas or a plan or something reasonable or a way to work out a problem or the ability to say, well, let's not try that physical violence first. Let's try this instead. There hasn't been a member <clears throat> of the pack in the TV series that's come forward like that. They're still figuring it out. Remember in the book series, when chapter one starts, it's 16 years later rather than 18. They've already come to terms with who and what they are, and they're in the forest practicing their shape-shifting. In the TV series, they're still trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Yeah. So to say that this person, this one or that one should be the leader, I can't say, because they're still trying to figure out um, where they are and what they are. And let's remember, the book is called, and the TV series is called Wolf Pack. 
not alpha wolf, right? So they are best when they work together as a team and they're strongest when they work together as a team. So I don't know that having one of them being alpha would make any sense. Who knows? I mean, you got Baron coming in on the outside. Who knows how, where he's going to fit in. And as the book hinted and the TV series, there could have been others that were left in the fire. Um, there's a line in, uh, I think it's the first book says, were there others that didn't make it? We don't know, but these four survived. So we're going to deal with these four, but it left it open that there could be others in the forest. And, you know, it's a TV series and uh, there could be others. It's a big forest out there. And, uh, but no, I don't think, uh, I'm kind of, Sorry, you lagged there. Could you repeat what you just said? You lagged there. Could you repeat what you just said? I'm, I'm we're really not going to speculate on who would be the alpha. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be one. I think the pack is a cohesive unit and they work best together. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'm going to talk about Team Wolf here, but I'm, I'm, I think I remember you saying that you've watched a bit of Team Wolf. Is that correct? Yes. I watched uh, about half the first season. Yeah. And then... Uh, my thoughts went to the wolf pack series. So in Teen Wolf, there are multiple supernatural like creatures like the Kenema or uh, Banshee and stuff like that. Would you ever want to see that in the live action of wolf pack? And is there any other supernatural creatures within your book or is it just strictly werewolves? <clears throat> in the books, it's all werewolves. Just werewolves. Um, there is a different kind of werewolf than wolf man. I mean, the, the classic one is, you know, a human gets bit by a wolf and becomes a werewolf. So in the fourth book, I wanted to explore the possibility of a wolf being bitten by a man or a werewolf. Yeah. And then that wolf would become werewolf. And with none of the preconceived notions that humans have about property, social norms, what's right and what's wrong. It would come to being this creature with all of the instincts of the wolf. Like everything is mine. If I can, you know, when I'm hungry, I get food from wherever it's available. And and then this new creature is terrorizing the town because it's taking livestock and, and you know, it has no bounds. Uh, but I don't, I know Teen Wolf is sort of like supernatural beacon. In Beacon Hills. Yeah. There's a supernatural beacon for all of these supernatural creatures, and that suited the show. Uh, I don't know if Wolfpack is the same kind of show because it's dealing with these this pack, and and we've clearly seen that the, the peril comes first from supernatural. Now we've kind of ended with that, and now I think for foreseeable future all of the threats are going to be human yeah they're going to make for an interesting thing and i know in teen wolf they had the hunters and they were a threat to the, the the wolves there but it's a different kind of threat you know these humans can lock you away in jail and you're kind of stuck there or they can put you in a hospital and there you are so um i i'm only speculating it's not my tv series but uh, I'd be surprised if suddenly there was the appearance of different uh, creatures. Yeah. Could be. I mean, Jeff's got if Jeff's got a plan for that. I'm sure he's going to put that seamlessly into the series, and everyone will say, "Oh yeah, okay, I get that." But um, personally, there was never any other supernatural creatures in the in the uh, book series. Werewolves were plenty. Yeah. Would you ever want to see, like, you know, vampires or, like I said before, like, uh, the Kenema, which is a South a Southern American, well, well, like, a supernatural creature in the uh, TV show of Wolfpack? Um, if something other supernatural creature comes in the TV series, I would expect it would be a different kind of werewolf. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's plenty of species. There's plenty of races of human beings. Who knows? There could be a different kind of um, werewolf. Uh, maybe we go to something like a were coyote or something like that. But I don't know. 
Yeah. I mean, that's all speculation on my part. I know fans would be saying, oh, he said there's going to be. I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. And I can't picture it. Um, the way I set it up, it was just about these personal teenage problems plus them being werewolves. Yeah. Not about, oh, my God, how are we going to deal with this other creature? Like, what? first of all, what the hell is that thing? There was none of that in the books. And uh, I can't speak to the series, but I would imagine that Jeff is going to keep it kind of focused on the planet. Now, I know that you said that you did watch a bit of Team Wolf. I have a future video plan where I'm putting uh, the pack from, like, Wolf Pack and the pack from, like, Team Wolf uh, against each other for a fight. Could I get, like, your personal opinion on who you think would win in a personal fight between Wolf Pack and uh, Team Wolf? Well... <laughs> you know, beyond my, I didn't expect these these kind of questions. Like, what if? Yeah. But uh, if the pack gets into a fight, all four will be involved. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know if uh, how many would be involved from the other side, and let's face it, all of their abilities haven't been explored yet. You know, one has strength, and we have the other abilities, and we've seen what we have to assume is barren what he looks like when he goes into beast mode yeah we haven't seen the other members of the pack do that and if they were going up against uh, creatures from uh, teen wolf they would have to be in beast mode with to uh, have a chance it would seem i don't this is all speculation and kind of crazy like which power ranger is the strongest <laughs> i don't know you know yeah. the blue one um but uh, maybe they, their powers get expanded and we get to see uh, what they're truly capable of. I, I, I haven't seen it yet. They're kind of figuring it out still. Yeah. Now, I know when Wolfpack uh, got announced back in 2022 or 2021 to be a live you know, action show by Jeff Davis, a lot of people said that it was a spinoff of Team Wolf. Now, I know that it's not, but do you think it would be cool in the possible future if, I'm just saying if, there's ever a crossover between the two for like a special movie or a TV, like a television season. Do you think it would be cool to have those two universes cross over? It would be cool, sure, but it's never going to happen. Yeah. It would be like, oh, could Sarah Michelle Gellar do a guest spot on Wolfpack as Buffy? It's never going to happen. Hmm. Um, never mind the, the rights involved. I know CBS Viacom owns for the most part, the uh, Teen Wolf, but it's still owned by in whole by MGM, and they would have to make some kind of agreement. And to go through all of that hassle just to have some Tyler Posey show up on screen as uh, as Scott. His name, first name Scott. Yeah, Scott McCall. Um, it just wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. And I know people are thinking that, and wouldn't it be cool? But these are two different universes, and the... Uh, you know, nothing else exists except these werewolves in my book version. So, <clears throat> um, and I don't think Jeff is going to entertain that either. They're two different universes. It's like, would um, would you expect any kind of other werewolf from any other werewolf universe to show up there? Yeah. It would be like, what are you doing? You know, it's not, it just, I don't think it would happen. I mean, it's it's great to speculate, and I know fans and fan bases do that, so you can continue on doing that. But from my perspective, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Yeah. In Team Wolf, it was con well, it was kind of speculated that the werewolves were created by Zeus through like an old mythology like uh, story there, where basically. Uh, a person named Lycan came and fed Zeus human remains and Zeus turned him into a werewolf. In your book series, did you ever go deeper to talk about and explain the origins and mythology of the werewolves, like how they're created, like the uh, the rules behind being a werewolf? Because in Teen Wolf, there's stuff like, you know, Mountain Ash and Wolf Spain. Was that ever introduced into your book series? Never. <laughs> I mean, coming from a, a horror background and writing all kind of horror stories, my whole thing was they just exist yeah i mean when a lot of times in horror novels <clears throat> everything is going great and this the suspense is terrific and everything and then at the end they have to explain 
something about why it happened or how it happened, and then it, everything gets ridiculous and falls apart. Yeah. I don't know where these werewolves came from. I'm assuming that the forest is full of them, and sometimes they come into the human realm and problems abound. Um, when, I, when I was doing book tours in elementary schools for a wolf pack, I went to, through central British Columbia, which is where the books are set. Hmm. And I would tell the, uh, the children, you know, before I started reading from the book, I'd say, I set the books in central British Columbia because everybody knows there's more werewolves in British Columbia than, say, northern Ontario. And their mouths just, what? Really? And I said, no, no, I'm just kidding. But <clears throat> they believe that. And yeah. that's all I needed to tell them. I gave them a deadpan explanation, and they took it. If I had to explain where these things came from, I don't think I'd do a good enough job to satisfy a reader's expectations. I even had trouble explaining how a forest ranger could adopt four children <laughs> all the same age, no birth certificate, no expectant mother around ever no one saw he just suddenly had four children and now he's raising them at his own where did they come from how did he get a birth certificate how did he get you know them enrolled in, uh, in in government programs and how did they start to exist how did they get to school with all of this no background yeah so i just decided to start the first chapter 16 years later and have the reader believe that all of those problems have been figured out i mean once you start thinking you know how did that happen things will fall apart really quickly so all you need to know it's like ray bradbury in science fiction when he needed to get his characters to another planet they took a rocket and that rocket got him there he didn't explain how the rocket worked how fast it traveled anything of those things he just said they took a rocket and they got to that other planet my explanation is these things exist and here they are existing within the human world and that's all you need to know yeah and for the most part it's been successful i know there's you know a fan base that wants to know how they came about i'll leave it to them to figure fill in the blanks and they can have online discussions about which one is really plausible and which one is the truth i don't know yeah um as we know in the TV series that there are three forms of the werewolves. We have the actual wolf form where they resemble a real life werewolf or wolf, sorry. They have the, uh, the human slash werewolf form where they have the glowing eyes, the teeth, the fangs and all that type of stuff. Then they have the, uh, the bestial werewolf, which happens through like, you know, uh, trauma and stuff. Is that the same thing that goes within your book as well? Or is there like, is there three werewolf forms within your book? <clears throat> well, I kind of had four. There was the two ends full human and full wolf yeah and then in the middle oh, excuse me in the middle there was uh, more more wolf than human and then more human than wolf so i didn't get into the, the, the beast mode because uh, really they didn't need it i mean they were plenty strong enough to handle any <clears throat> any problem in their werewolf form but, uh, you know, television has limitations for makeup and CGI and things like that, especially television series, CGI budgets are, you know, not as good as they could be for a feature film. So I only limited those, those uh, four. And you could always, almost say there's only three then, each end of the spectrum and then the, the one in the middle. Yeah. Um, were you inspired when you were, like, I have a question. That's a two-part question here. Uh, but when you were writing the Wolfpack book series, were you ever inspired by other books? Well, I came from a background of writing horror stories from all kinds of you know, all kinds of horror stories and uh, read werewolf stories and, and all kinds of things. I just wanted to set a werewolf story in the modern day with teenagers and have it be portrayed as realistic yeah that was my main thing <clears throat> if i've been inspired there's a there's all kinds of films that i watched of course one in particular a canadian werewolf film called ginger snaps i don't know if you've seen that movie 
when I first saw that movie, I, the way they handled it, and it was realistic, and the there was it was a curse, not a blessing, and I just loved the way that was. So that was probably an inspiration to do this kind of thing. Have the supernatural element, absolutely, but set it in the real world where people can believe it's possible. Yeah. Portray it in a way that doesn't consider the reader, you know, talking down to the reader and just making outlandish claims that they expect them to believe. Let's portray it in a way that seems realistic, like it could happen on your street or at your school. I have a friend who's also a YouTuber, his name is Jade's Corner, and he's written a book called True Alpha. In that book, he's inspired by like multiple different shows and movies and other books, and he, he uses aspects from like each individual, you know, series that he's inspired by to write his own original story. A lot of people give him like a lot of hate, because at first glance, it does seem a bit misleading. Would you like, would there be any advice to give him who is trying to, you know, make it as a book writer uh, when it comes to people doubting his work? Well, there's always going to be haters. Yeah. As a matter of fact, on one forum just this past month, I posted about um, a daily deal on the Kindle version of one of the books, Cry Wolf, I think it was. And this person on there was like just berating me because um, it wasn't it wasn't uh, talking about the season being renewed and i said no but personally this is great because no i i talked about the arabic edition that was yeah it. and i said there's more people going to read it in a part of the world that they hadn't read any of my work before and it's expanding the universe and you know i'm just happy that more people are reading and then she started saying well your book is old and it has probably has grammatical errors in it and if it was any good, it would be reprinted or redone. And it, it has been, you know, there's editions from 2004 and edition 2022. But even that, I mean, I'm the guy who created the book that the series is based on, and I'm getting hate from someone who loves the series or interest in the series and somehow is, you know, crapping all over my effort. And I'm, I can't believe it. Yeah. So to this person, there's really no real newish new things to invent in all of these you can <clears throat> put a twist on some aspect of it and call it new which hopefully i did in here something is new <clears throat> but they say that good songwriters borrow from other song songwriters great songwriters steal yeah and you can put that across any artistic endeavor if you're thinking that you're going to recreate and reinvent the wheel, even with werewolves or vampires, I can assure you that any aspect you think that, oh, I just came up with this brilliant idea, no one's ever thought of it before, there's probably five people that have written and published with that idea in there. So taking little bits from everybody else and putting it together and making it your own package is fine. So, but one thing is key you have to acknowledge all of that yeah right you he does say, oh no i invented that or you know this is new or i did say look i took from, from everywhere and i made something that is personal to me this that's what he does that's business. what he says that's what he says and that's fine and there's going to be haters but man you know they're they're all over the place and you're never going to satisfy everybody so just take it with a grain of salt the most important thing, and this goes to anybody who's an aspiring writer out there, finish what you start and just do what matters to you. Don't write about, say, I'm going to do this and they're going to make a series out of it or I'm going to put this in because this actor would be perfect for this role. It doesn't work like that. You write the story that you want to write that's important to you and finish it. And make yeah. sure it's finished because just finishing something is an accomplishment on its own getting it published in one form or another is another level altogether so congratulations on that and that's the only thing people should be happy for if you don't like the way it was handled then write your own version yeah do it the way you see it should be done that's that's the answer to it 
That's good. That's good. Is there any like advice when it comes to because he has a plan for like twelve book series? Is there any advice given that fact that you've written four Wolfpack books that you'd give to him and you know writing his future installments of his own books and any others out there who are also inspiring? Um, well, having a, a story arc that goes twelve books is great. Whether you're going to find somebody who's interested in publishing twelve books is another matter. So make sure that each time you finish a book. If it finishes there, it'll be all right. You know, yeah. uh, it can't be like, oh, well, I have to write eight more books before I get to the end of the story. Because one, it's a challenge to finish writing a book. Once you've done that, it's a challenge to get it published. And after that, every book is a struggle. You'd think, you know, I've done 35 books and I've been successful. Some of them have been bestsellers, not New York Times bestsellers, but bestsellers in their category or whatever. And you would think that, oh, it's easy for me. I just call somebody up and say, I have another book to sell. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I still have to go through the process. I have to pitch it. I have to write it. I have to try and sell it. I have to make revisions. I have to change things so someone publishing it is happy with it. All like that. It is a struggle every time. And it's great to have a plan because I didn't have a plan for four books in the Wolfpack series. I did the first one. It was a best-selling book for the publisher, won a couple of awards. Hey, how about I do a couple more books? Sure. So we did two more. And then can I do one more? Yes. And then the sales of the series fell off and there was no more interest in a book five. And that's the reality of publishing. So it's great to have a plan, just one book at a time, do the best you can with it. And when that's done and it's set off and that's your baby and it's born, then look to the next one. Yeah. That's the best advice I can do. Is you sit down in front of a computer, start writing, and you don't get up until it's finished. And that's uh, you know accomplishment on its own. And then publication of each one is another milestone. How do you go to get a book published? Well, there's all different ways. Uh, the best for an aspiring writer is to write the full book, make it as best you can, and then try to get it published. There's no secret formula. There's no uh, call this guy and he'll help you get it done. Every every book I've ever done had a different route to getting published. Uh, some were circuitous, some languished, some were almost instantaneous, and I could never tell how. Yeah. Um, I'm at the point now where if I wanted to do, do a new book, I've been... I haven't published a new book in so long. I'd have to finish the whole, I'd have to write the whole book and then try to send it to my agent and get to see if he could sell it to a publisher. And, um, and then you're going to ask, how do you get an agent? Well, my agent contacted me because he'd read a short story that I had in, in a book that he'd represented and he wondered if I was being represented by anybody. Yeah. And it went that way. But even then I said, I have a book. If you want to represent that book, then you can represent me. And, it worked like that. It was a negotiation. Nothing was ever easy. You know, to think that there's some secret formula, some handshake, or name recognition, or anything like that. Even even with the Wolfpack series on TV, and me being the author of that, that's not opening the doors you would think. But it's great, and it's a great uh, handshake. You know, my name's Adrian Van Belken. I wrote the Wolfpack uh, books the series is based on. But no one's going to say, oh, where's your next book? I'll publish it for you. It doesn't work that way. It's, yeah. it's all based on merit and and sales. I give you that. Like if I sold a million copies of Wolfpack, then someone would be lining up saying, well, let's do another book. But that didn't happen. Hmm. So every every book is a different one. And it's hard. It's, it's one of the hardest things to do. And uh, if anyone even writes a book, my congratulations to you. If you've got a publisher for a book it's a cause for celebration drink a bottle of wine and celebrate because after that then you're in a whole nother realm and now you've got to sell books and that's just as hard so yeah there's no secret to it and i'm sorry i wish i could tell you one but there is there just isn't any um to the fans out there who want a season two of wolfpack what do you think is the best way to show the fact that they want a season two well, I think all of that is going on now. People are using the hashtags Renew Wolfpack or Season 2 or doing all that. And I think you just have to be patient because 
there's two strikes going on right now and nothing's going to happen while those strikes are going on, the Writers Guild of America and the Screen Actors Guild. So nothing really is going to happen. And I don't think any efforts like, oh, we want Wolfpack, we want Wolfpack. I don't think that's going to matter because the studios aren't even negotiating with their principals, the writers and the actors. They're not negotiating right now. So while they might be interested to know that the fans are still rabid for a uh, season two, I don't think it's going to have an effect until the, the strike's over. When the strike's over, then it'll be like, hey, now the strike's over. What, a, what about Wolfpack uh, season two? And, you know, by the time the strike's over, they've had plenty of this time to decide whether they want to do it or not. Yeah. I'm sure the decision has been made already, just waiting for this, the strike to be over to announce it. Because it wouldn't, I don't think it would be in the best interest of the studio to announce a season two of a series while no one's negotiating with the, the people who would make that series happen. So I think we just have to wait for the strikes to be over, hopefully sooner rather than later. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. What are your thoughts going like uh, about the strikes that are currently going on within Hollywood? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I want to put out there that I'm a supporter of uh, both strikes. I'm not a member of either union, but I have been a union member and I have gone out on con first contract strike at a newspaper. Um, and it's a terrible time and it went for 106 days. This is even going looks like it's going to go longer than that. And, you know, the, the people at the top end, the showrunners and people that are famous, they're going to be fine because it's the people that, you know, bit players and extras and people who, you know, have a few gigs a year. They're the ones that are in, in trouble. But I'm totally supportive of that. And I want to make sure that I'm on this podcast supporting, uh, promoting my books. Yeah. I'm mentioning the series. But I'm not telling everybody to go watch the series or anything like that. All these people who are watching this are already familiar with the series enough. But I'm not advocating for the, the show. I'm advocating for my books and comparing them to the series. Yeah. And I do hope that the strikes are negotiated fairly and the writers and the actors come out with a fair uh, result. I must say, my option agreement with CBS Viacom has a stipulation for a share of modified adjusted gross receipts, M-A-G-R. And that's uh, Hollywood talk for profit. So what they're negotiating now is how to figure out profit from streaming projects. So who knows, I might benefit from the strike in some small way yeah. sometime in the future. I'm not holding out, uh, holding my breath because, you know, having a Hollywood pro uh, property claim a, a profit is almost unheard of. They'll go for years saying, we haven't made any money yet back yet on it, even though, you know, something like Forrest Gump made six, $300 million and Winston Groom had to sue, actually, Paramount Studios to get a settlement because he had a, a part in the profits. And they said, no, I hadn't made any profit. Forrest Gump, if you can believe it. Hmm. So that's the kind of thing they're up against, and I support their strike, and I'll uh, wait patiently for it to end to see what uh, my fate is and the fate of the TV series. Is there any way for people who, like, who aren't union members, who aren't actors, who aren't writers to support the strike? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I was thinking if I lived in Los Angeles and I decided I would go down to wherever some of the picket lines were, um, I think... Uh, you know, I, I, they'd be happy if I picked up a, a placard and started marching in, in the picket line. Yeah. You could do that, or you could go down there and just support your the actors and writers that are on strike. Who knows, you might see somebody you, you recognize. Um, there's other things you can do. I I'm, I'm assume you could, like, for some of the streaming services, you could cancel your subscription for now, or you could refuse to participate in, in uh, you know, there's all kinds of things, but just even letting your, if you're in touch with any actors or you're on any uh, forums or websites, just to let those people know that you support what they're doing, it makes makes a difference for the people on the strike line to know that 
while they're fighting big business, uh, people who appreciate what they do are supporting them in their endeavor rather than uh, studios. So there's, you know, just be a participant and show your support in any way you can. Yeah. Now the last question I have for you, Edo, is a two-parter. Uh, now that we're ending, like ending this uh, video off, is there anything you want to say to the people who are watching this currently? Um, if anyone is watching, and I appreciate that you are, and if you're interested in my books, I'm, I appreciate that because I found that a lot of times people aren't interested in the author of the, the novel that inspired the series. I'll give you one example. Um, there was some Instagram account from Italy that was going to be about the Wolfpack show. And I thought, oh, great, I'm half Italian. My mother was Italian. I, I understand the language a little bit. And as I showed you before, there was this edition of Wolfpack that was in Italy. And yeah. So I said, oh, that's great. You know, like, I explained all that to her. I sent her an uh, image of the cover of the book.